This passage with me over the next half hour, really with one dominant thought in mind, and that is relearning leadership in the kingdom. Relearning leadership in the kingdom. Mark chapter 10, beginning verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him. He said, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later, he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one on your right and one on your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right hand or on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the 10 began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Holy Father, we bow in this moment. We take nothing for granted. We pray for your spirit to work through me by the power of your scripture and into our lives in this sacred moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. S.I. McMillan, his book, None of These Diseases, tells the story of a young girl, an 18-year-old girl who was applying to go to college. She wanted to go off to college, but her heart sank because she was the first in her family to ever go to college. She saw her hopes of getting in dim. Her hopes sank even more when on the questionnaire, the application, she came across the question that asked this, are you a leader? She was honest and self-aware enough to know that she wasn't and conscientious enough to know that she needed to be honest. So she wrote the word no and returned the application expecting the worst. To her surprise, a couple of weeks later, she received a letter from the college that said this, dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year, our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we felt it imperative that all of them have at least one follower. <laughs> the point of the anecdote is clear. We live in the age of leadership. Everyone aspires to leadership. Everyone thinks of leadership. There's leadership curriculum, leadership conferences, leadership books. There's everything out there on leadership around us. And to be quite candid, I have a love-hate relationship with the topic myself. I find myself reading books on leadership and listening to podcasts occasionally on leadership, but all the time with this love-hate dynamic in my own heart, wanting to say, let's get back to scripture and what scripture has to say about leadership. God calls us and equips us to lead and lead faithfully in our churches and our ministries and to the stewardship he has entrusted to us. But I'm afraid that often in the church, too often we have let secular leadership theories slip in and it has disoriented ourselves as to what leadership and faithfulness and fruitfulness are to look like. Perhaps pragmatic values size and numbers and dollars have crowded out leadership from a biblical perspective. 
Now, my goal this morning in this passage is not to present you with a few pithy leadership phrases or a few leadership nuggets and kind of add to that long list of leadership observations, but rather my desire is to eclipse and reframe altogether how we think about leadership in the kingdom. And as I do that, I must acknowledge on the front end that I don't believe this passage is first and foremost about leadership. But I think we learn as we read through this passage and we study it together, we pick up verse by verse what it means to be in the kingdom, what it means to serve in the kingdom, what does it mean to labor in the kingdom, and then we learn that leadership is subjected to service, to labor, to ministry in the kingdom. Now, as we come to this passage, there are a few pitfalls to avoid on the front end. We read of this annoying exchange between Jesus and his two disciples here, James and John. Time doesn't permit us to work through the previous two chapters, but this is the third in as many chapters, revelations, Jesus gives his disciples about his impending suffering, his impending death, his impending crucifixion. And it is quite clear. His disciples, though, push back. And then most egregiously on this third giving in this, at this chapter 10, which is a, a fulcrum of the book, and they push back and they begin to argue about status in the kingdom and position in the kingdom. The first pitfall to avoid is to look at this passage with personal hubris and think, I would never do that. Brothers and sisters, we do it all the time. The second pitfall to avoid in this passage is these three words in verse 45, son of man. We often hear this passage preached and we come across Son of Man and people think of that and present that as Jesus in lowliness. And Jesus one is one who is marked by lowliness, yes. But we understand this phrase from the book of Daniel chapter 7, and Son of Man is one with authority, which makes this passage all the more intense because the one with authority is the one we see serving and submitting The pitfall, the third pitfall to avoid is the dash to the practical. For in this passage, the application really is the theology of it. It's not about leadership nuggets. It's about a fundamental disposition of the kingdom itself. And most ultimately, the pitfall to avoid is to fail to see the Christological implication of verse 45, where all this dovetails to Jesus himself, who declares, I came to give my life as a ransom for many. So what do we see going on here? What are we going to learn? What do I want you to follow with me? The first is the way of the kingdom is the way of suffering. Verse 38 and verse 39, the way of the kingdom is the way of suffering. So again, Jesus in verse 33 has presented them quite clearly. And then verse 34, they will mock him. They will spit on him. They will scourge him they will kill him. Three days later, he will rise again. The response in verse 35, evidently, James and John then come to him and they ask this this childlike question, will you do for us whatever we ask? Like a a, a child coming to a parent and saying, I have a question for you, but before I tell you the question, will you pre-commit on the front end to agreeing to, to give me an affirmative answer? Teacher, Will you do for us whatever we ask? And he said to them wisely, what do you want me to do? And they said to him, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left. I trust you recognize the absurdity of the request. So let's move then to the answer, verse 38. Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? He is reminding them that in the kingdom, the way of the kingdom is the way of suffering. Are you able to drink the cup, this common metaphor for suffering in the scriptures and to be baptized, to be be immersed into the sufferings of Christ? And I think these two pictures here reflect the the active and passive suffering for Christ actively as he actively took the cup of suffering and then chose to lay down his life passively to be nailed to the tree. And then verse 39, they again respond arrogantly, incomprehensibly so. We are able, and Jesus says, oh, you better be. The cup that I drink, you will drink. 
and you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. What is Jesus saying? He's saying the way of the kingdom is the way of the suffering. And his prediction came true, did it not? In Acts 12, we see King Herod putting James to death with a sword. And of course, John was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. These men knew suffering. The first time I ever preached in big church it was about the year 2000 on a Sunday night at Dolphin Way Baptist Church. I'd done some Sunday school teaching. I'd preached in some prison ministries and things. But the first big time big church was on a Sunday night at Dolphin Way Baptist Church. And I preached 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, that great doxology of praise there. And I remember when I got to the portion of that passage where Peter talks about suffering and talks about trials. And I felt absolutely foolish preaching that verse within that passage. And I tried to make up for it by talking about Christian suffering in the abstract, in the historical. Over the centuries, Christians have paid a great price. And even now, in certain parts of the world, Christians are paying a great price for their faith. I felt so foolish then, talking of suffering in the year 2000. Now in the year 2016, as I lead a seminary, I feel foolish if I don't talk about suffering with our students. Why? Because the world has changed so quickly, the cultural tide has shifted so dramatically, and I fear for us, brothers and sisters, I fear for us that we have upped our game with branding. We've upped our game with social media. We are really good at self-promotion. We are good at the paraphernalia and the accoutrements and the amenities of ministry, the superficialities of the call to follow Christ. But at our core, we are not yet ready for ministry in the 21st century with a world and a culture and even a government that's increasingly saying, we understand what you believe and we shall have none of it. Jesus' promises to these two men, these are promises that come to us as well. As he watched, a great hymn writer challenges us with his great hymn, Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own his cause or blush to speak his name? Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas? Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stem the flood? Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? Sure, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. What is the way of the kingdom? The way of the kingdom is the way of suffering. Notice with me secondly, notice in verse 40. The way of the kingdom, secondly, is the way of surrender. To sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And I chose the word surrender here, not because I needed an S, but because I believe it rightly encapsulates verse 40, and it is a word that the church needs to recover. My church, growing up as a kid, I heard often a call to surrender to ministry, and quite frankly, it, it tripped me up. Because my adolescent understanding of what that meant was that people going into ministry did not want to go into ministry. And that you, you did not desire it, you ran from it, that if God were calling you, he would finally subjugate you to it, and okay, I, I surrender, I'll do it. And so when I began to feel a call for ministry, to ministry, and a desire for ministry, I thought this mustn't be of the Lord because people going into the ministry don't desire it, you're supposed to not desire it, and then God makes you surrender. And then I came across 1 Peter 3, 1, and was liberated by the fact that the desire for ministry was a good thing. But the word surrender is a good word if we understand it not to mean that ministry is something we don't want to do, but we'll do it after God subjugates us. Surrender is a good word if we understand it means re releasing ourselves of our rights, of our prerogatives, of our places of service, of our own ambitions for life and ministry, and we surrender ourselves to where God would have us to serve and to what God would have us to do. Verse 40, to sit on my right or my left, this is not mine to give, it is for those for whom it has been prepared. What do we see? We see that God is a micromanager in his kingdom. He's not merely concerned about the macro picture. 
God is concerned at the micro level of his church and of your life. God has a specific call on your life, your ministry, and our response is to surrender to that. And listen to me, God gives each one of us strengths and weaknesses and giftings and talents and skills and experiences and all of that's different. And we understand that the promise of God through Matthew 16 is that Christ is building his church. And we understand from Ephesians 4 that he's doing that by calling out pastors and evangelists and ministers for the church and equipping the church for the work of service. And the quicker you understand the glory of that work and the romance of his call to your life, my friend, you will be liberated in ministry. The quicker you come to terms with a basic self-awareness of how God has made you, of how God has gifted you, and the quicker you come to peace with that. Brothers and sisters, you will be infinitely more fulfilled in ministry. There's some of you here today that have conceptualized yourself as a scholar, and you want to be a scholar, you want to be a writer, you want to be a teacher, but you're making a C in theology class, and so you're living a miserable life thinking you want to be a scholar, but you're having trouble passing baby Greek. Well, it's probable that if you're struggling at that level, you're not going to be a scholar. But that's okay. That's perfect. God can use you in dramatic ways if you can't speak English, much less another language. Understand your role in the kingdom and how God has made you and how God has equipped you and follow it. The way of the kingdom is the way. Surrender. I told our students a couple of years ago in a graduation ceremony to our graduates, I said, I want to challenge you to take your resume, toss it to the wind, drink a six-pack of Red Bull, and just go and preach wherever God calls you. I got a letter in the mail about a week later from a little old lady who rebuked me for encouraging our students to drink alcohol. <laughs> I wrote her back, sweetly informing her that Red Bull was a caffeinated drink, not a beverage one. A touch of hyperbole, perhaps. But be willing to follow God's call regardless of what it does for your resume. God is bigger than that. There are people who need to go pastor churches that are dying at the fork of the road, and it doesn't matter if you're Adrian Rogers reincarnated. It's not going to grow, but it's still a good and noble work. As a footnote, let me challenge you men in the room that are attracted to church planning. That is a good and noble work. Kansas City is a sin city. We have many students coming for church planning. But don't think that all of you are called to plant a church. We have thousands of churches that need young men to enter the pastorate and bring energy there and revitalize it and labor away. And maybe the sledding will be tough, but it will be glorious sledding if God has called you to it. The way of the kingdom is the way of surrender. Notice thirdly, the way of the kingdom is the way of service. Verses 41 through 44. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. They called them to himself. Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, they lord it over them and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. The way of the kingdom is the way of service. And here Jesus is zeroing in on the great contrast between the, the mindset of the lost and the mindset of the saved. Of a secular mindset and a spiritual mindset. This great contrast. And we have to remind ourselves that in the, the kingdom, there is an inverted topography. The kingdom brings us an inverted topography. The way of the world is a pyramid where the stronger on top. The way of the kingdom, the pyramid is turned upside down.
Are you ready to serve? My wife and I were in seminary and got the privilege to pastor a church while we were in seminary. I was completing my MDiv and then begin the PhD program and it was our first pastor and we're so delighted to go and it was three years and eight months of pretty much bliss start to finish. The church folks were sweet. The church grew dramatically. We had a lot of people saved, a lot of people joined. It was a small church. We went there, it was, you know, 60 or 70 people and it grew to 130, 140 on Sunday morning. So we're not talking, uh, I'm not trying to suggest this is, uh, you know, J.D. Greer up here on church planning. But it was just sweet years. The church doubled and the budget doubled and people were being saved. And it just, it just like whatever we touched turned to gold. And, and I left there thinking, man, I can find any old church out there and I can go in there and I can turn that thing around and I'm ready. God called us to go back to the seminary and begin working the president's office while we were there. I had the opportunity to be interim of another church in the broader Louisville area. And it was a church that had been on a decline since the mid-1950s. Demographics had wreaked havoc on the church. We had violent crimes committed on the church premises, and an opportunity to be interim pastor there, and then serve as leading pastor for a while. But I remember going to that church thinking, they have had really poor leadership since the mid-1950s. I thought that. I'm, I'm ashamed to tell you this. I'm embarrassed to tell you this. I thought they've had poor leadership since the 1950s, more than likely. And I'll just go here and work harder and be smarter and preach better than these predecessors and we'll have a run like we just had. I, I'm, embar I'm absolutely embarrassed to tell you I thought that. Well, let me tell you, we went there and we worked hard and we preached like we preached before and we shepherded like we shepherded before. A banner year was a plateaued year. I remember throughout those several years of serving there, of God bringing me lower and lower and lower. And stay with me here because the point goes back to these three verses. Of bringing me lower and lower and lower in understanding. No, it's not about what I touch turns to go. It's about what God has to do. And for me, one of the, the difficult points to swallow was the fact that just by preaching every week, there weren't more and more people coming every week to hear me preach. And I went into that church with the mindset that, I mean, I got to study, you know, X amount of hours a week and nothing should compromise that and nothing should, should cut into that. And these people don't value the pulpit enough and they don't give me the time to preach. But the truth of the matter, the church was a never ending line of benevolence needs, of hospital visits, of broken marriages that needed counseling. And God had to reprogram my basic understanding of pastoral ministry and the pulpit and say, don't you hide behind your study time for not meeting the basic needs of the people in the pew. I fear the pendulum has swung, brothers and sisters, in our churches today. And a generation ago, it was visitation, visitation, visitation. We had to swing the pendulum back to prioritize the pulpit and sermon preparation. And I'm not suggesting we should minimize that, but I am pointedly saying this, never hide behind that as an excuse to neglect the people of God. The way of the kingdom is the way of service. Servant is a person who willingly sacrifices for others, a slave, a person without rights. And we enter into the kingdom and we enter into the church and we seek to labor that way and to serve that way. And stay with me. The dirty little secret is, as you serve them, they will serve you. As you love them, they will love you. As you're gracious to them, they will reciprocate with graciousness to you. That's the dirty little secret to this in the local church. The way of the kingdom is not triumph. It's not a formula. It's not what worked at one church or work at the next. Sometimes you go into a church and you have to acknowledge this challenges are bigger than me. I will seek to be faithful. I will bend my preconceptions for ministry. I will serve these people. Those are the needs. And we'll rejoice at the fruit God gives us. Even if the sledding is tough, it will be glorious if that is the role he's given you. Notice with me fourthly. What do we see here? Finally, let's button this up in verse 45. We see the way of sacrifice. Verse 45. This passage, as I read it, is barreling towards verse 45 
as this point of punctuation. Jesus gives this ultimate explanation and this ultimate really example of his own life, but it's not just a leadership nugget. It's the gospel in a verse. And he's in essence saying that the culmination of surrender, the culmination of of service, the culmination of suffering is verse 45. For even the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man? This one in all his glory. This phrase Jesus adapts and owns for the book of Daniel. This one in authority who sups with the ancient of days. This one of marked power is willing to come and bring himself low. How low? To give his life as a ransom for many. To purchase, to buy back, to die for our sins, to to redeem a people from the price of their sin. That is who he is. And stay with me here. The grand truth of verse 45 is Jesus' sacrifice was for our propitiation. Our sacrifice is for proclamation. Jesus' sacrifice for propitiation, our sacrifice for proclamation. What does this mean for us? It means this, and I close. It means as we listen to our podcasts, as we read our books, as we peruse our blogs, as we rightly evaluate and interpret and occasionally incorporate the best of leadership, of organizational theory, the best of these things the world has to offer, we take all of that and we bring it low before Mark 10. And we understand our ministry is not primarily about building an organization. It's not primarily about getting the right administrative team together. It's about being the right men and women of God in accordance with the way of the kingdom. Leading up to verse 45, where we acknowledge and we attempt to sacrifice for gospel proclamation because he has sacrificed for propitiation. We live in a world looking, craving for Saul's. Let us be the people who aspire to be Jesse's youngest son. Thank you, Dr. Aiken.